When I, an awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Hi, I'm Greg Albrecht, and it's a privilege and distinct honor to welcome you to the audio teaching ministry of CWR, Christianity Without the Religion. We realize that there are new people, and you may be one of them, joining us all the time. And so if you want to know more about us, you can find out more at our website at www.ptm, for Plain Truth Ministries, ptm.org, or you may already be there, and so you have other ways of... uh, navigating on our website to find out more about us and the resources and the many ministries that we have. Or you can call us at 1-800, toll-free, 1-800-309-4466. Our message today here at CWR, our audio teaching ministry, is titled, These Little Ones. Here's a summary statement as we begin of the Christ-centered teaching we're going to be studying and pondering today. The greatest in the kingdom of heaven are those who are regarded as least in the kingdoms of our world. Before we read from our keynote passage in Matthew chapter 18, verses 10 through 13, join me now in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we pray today for those in pain, those who are alone, those who fight debilitating diseases who grieve the loss of loved ones and those who suffer from hunger and thirst. We pray for those who are forgotten and even despised, those who are in physical or spiritual chains, those who are victimized, used, and abused. We pray for those who are regarded as least in the world in which we live, and we pray that you would teach us the eternal, lasting lesson Jesus gave when he spoke of these little ones. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Matthew chapter 18, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 18, verses 10 through 14 is our passage. I may have said 10 through 13 earlier, and among other things you'll know in this uh, teaching ministry, I am far from perfect. So there you go. Matthew 18, verses 10 through 14. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly, I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. Our keynote passage appears in the middle of the 18th chapter of Matthew. In order to better appreciate why Jesus is saying what he's saying about these little ones. Let's go back briefly and notice how the chapter begins. Jesus is answering a question posed to him by his own disciples here in chapter 18, and here's the question, chapter 18, verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? The question is about greatness. It's about social rank in the kingdom of heaven. All through the Gospels, Jesus turns the values of the 
kingdoms of this world, the, the perspectives of the kingdoms of this world upside down when he contrasts them with those of the kingdom of heaven. So here's how he answers the question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He says, as I summarized before, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven are those who are regarded as least in the kingdoms of our world. So Jesus follows on that question with two examples of those who are least in our world, but greatest in the kingdom of heaven. In verses 1 through 6, a passage which we have not read, but it sets up our keynote passage in verses 10 through 13. He gives the first example as he answers the question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And who are they? They are children. They are these little ones. Children are the first example of those regarded by Jesus as least in our world, but greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus identifies children as these little ones in the first six verses of the 18th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. If you have your Bibles open, you can read along in verses 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 with me as we look at these mentions of children. If not, you'll just have to trust me to read it carefully, or when you get to a place where you can open a Bible, you can check up on me and see if I did read the Bible correctly. In verse 2, he called a little child to them and placed the child amongst them. And then he said in verse 3, unless you become like little children. In verse 4, he says, whoever takes the lowly position of this child. And in verse 5, he says, and whoever welcomes one such child in my name. And then finally in verse 6, whoever causes one of these little ones, a clear indicator that these little ones is a reference at that particular moment in Matthew chapter 18 to children. Now let's stop a moment and get our bearings. One of the common mistakes made when we read the Bible is to read our world into what we've just read, into the culture, the literature, and the language of the world of the Bible. All right, Jesus is talking about little children. So we, particularly in our North American world of the 21st century, start thinking about little children and the way we regard them and take care of them and love them and deem them to be among our most precious priorities. Beyond that, we start thinking about the wants and needs of children as articulated by the market-driven economy in which we live in the North American and Western European 21st century world. So when the idea of little children comes to mind to us, we might think of our presumed responsibilities as parents and grandparents to give children everything. The advertising world tells us they need dolls and toys and sugar-infused breakfast cereals and skateboards and video games and bicycles. Our North American world, rightfully so, sees children as precious and wonderful gifts. And, indeed, children are our future. But then our market-based economy has also gone beyond that and educated us to think of little children as little human beings that we have to indulge. We've been essentially brainwashed to think it's our sacred duty to see to it that every wish and every whim of these little bundles of energy and self-determination is fulfilled. On the other hand, in our 21st century world, in North America and in Europe, and in many of the first world countries around this world, where many of you live, We also realize there are many children in our world today, including in our North American and European and first world countries, who are hungry, thirsty, and malnourished. We know that many children are oppressed, sadly, pathetically. We know that they are used, abused, and trafficked to meet the base lusts of perverted adults. For all of that said, in all of that context, When we read of little children in Matthew 18 and Jesus talking about them, 
We know that we value children today, but as we seek to understand more of what Jesus had to say, we must not think that our values were present in the society and culture in which Jesus lived and in which he gave us this teaching. The vast majority of all children in Jesus' day and age came into the world with one job and only one expectation in the minds of parents and older mature adults to serve the needs of others. Children existed to serve. They did not exist to be served. That was the value of Jesus' day, his age, his culture. In Jesus' day, children were regarded as property. They were regarded as free labor. And if even by the early age of, say, five or six, they were unable to start making some kind of contribution to the welfare of others and of their family and of their parents and older siblings, they were considered to be a burden. Of course, the lesson Jesus is teaching is not primarily about physical children, is it? As adults, we obviously can't go back. And as he said in the first passage here in Matthew 18, become like a little child physically. But the lesson is that we are willing, as verse 3 in Matthew chapter 18 says, to be changed and transformed in such a way that we become like little children. Well, what would that be like in that original culture? It is those who seem to be insignificant and worthless as children were in the time of Christ who are greatest in Jesus' eyes. The little ones, okay? Not those who build the biggest church buildings, not the preachers who manage to fill the parking lot of the church building with the most cars, or fill the seats in the church building with the most rear ends. Those are not the ones Jesus is talking about. Those who the kingdoms of our world regard as trivial and unimportant as children were in the time of Christ are the greatest in Jesus' eyes. Not those who drive the biggest and most expensive cars to a church building are those who put the most money in the offering plate, are those who donate enough money to a denomination to have a building named after them, or to a university, for that matter, to have a a building named after them. Now we're going to come back with all of that said as background to our own keynote passage here in verses 10 through 14 of the Gospel of Matthew chapter 18. The second little one, these little ones whom Jesus said are the greatest, those who are regarded as least in the kingdoms of this world, are those who are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The second example is of a lost sheep who represent, in this particular case, one sheep out of a herd of 100. In this particular example, the lost sheep who represents only 1% of the worth of the total flock is the second example Jesus gives us here as those who are regarded as least in the kingdoms of our world, yet he values them the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Let's read our passage in Matthew 18, verses 10 through 15 once again. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. So in saying that in verse 10, he has in mind, and his audience would have had had in mind, first of all, the little children he spoke of. But now he gives us a second example of little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? Here's an example of another kind of little one. And if the man who looks for the one sheep finds it, truly, I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 who did not wander off. In the same way, how do we know this one percenter is a little one? Verse 14, in the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. I believe I said that's verse 15 before. I'm getting mixed up. It's actually verse 14. Verse 14. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones 
should perish. So he uses the example of sheep, but of course, humanizing the example, anthropomorphically speaking of sheep as humans who are regarded as having little or no worth at the very most 1%. So in the parable of the lost sheep, also found in Luke 15, Jesus remains focused on little ones, these little ones perceived as having little or no value of having no use. In the passage, our keynote passage, he speaks of one sheep who is lost, but Jesus, as the chief shepherd of the kingdom of heaven, is willing to leave the 99 and go and find the one who represents only 1% of the total value and worth of the entire flock. He does such a thing because his core value is this. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. If he had come to be served, then he primarily would have been worried about the 99% because you never, ever, ever would leave the 99% if you want to be served to the maximum and go after 1% because the 99% may in some way be diminished or decreased by the time you get back to them. So you let the 1% go and write it off as a, a, a bad experience, as a bad debt. So when Jesus said this, to go after the one and leave the 99, this had to be, this assessment and judgment was a preposterous and absurd thing to say in that world or in ours for that matter, because our values are completely skewed toward those who can make the greatest contribution to the good of the whole. But Jesus isn't done yet here in the Gospel of Matthew. In one of the parables, the parable of the sheep and the goats, found in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, which we do not have time to read, he gives yet another example, which I want to point out as we conclude, of those who are regarded as least in the kingdoms of our world, yet are valued as greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Just a few pages on from Matthew chapter 18, from our keynote passage, you can turn there later on and take the time if you wish. In the 25th chapter of Matthew, we find the parable of the sheep and the goats, and I think I mentioned that's in verses 31 through 46. In this parable, Jesus says that his sheep will pass on the love, care, compassion, mercy, and grace that they have received from him so that others may receive that grace in his name. So in the 25th chapter of Matthew, in the parable of the sheep and the goats, and again, using the sheep and goats as metaphors, anthropomorphizing them, if you like, as humans. Here's a third example we can consider about those who are regarded as least being the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. In this case, Jesus is talking about the least being those who are served by his followers, his sheep. He's giving examples of the kinds of people Christ followers will help and to whom they will minister. These people, says Jesus, are worthy of our time. Our time, meaning our, meaning Christ followers, the time of his sheep. Even though they're often cast aside and abandoned by the values of the kingdoms of our world. According to the parable of the sheep and the goats, found again in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46, the least of these, as Jesus says, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, include those who are hungry and thirsty, who are strangers, who are in desperate need of clothing, those who are sick, and those who are in prison. He gives a list of the least of these. And there's several things about this list I want to point out as we conclude this message which we're talking about, the least of these, these little ones. Number one, those who are called in Matthew chapter 25, the least of these are placed in that category by our society and culture, not by Jesus. We can almost hear Jesus saying this phrase, the least of these, in an ironic sense, as if he's placing quote marks around, quote, the least of these, end quote, as if he's saying, the least according to your standards and your judgments, certainly not mine. We need to underline this important value. It is the kingdoms of our world that define winners and losers. It's the kingdoms of our world that define success as excess, making lists of who's hot and who's not. 
It's the kingdoms of our world that despise these people. It esteems on the outside looking in while worshiping at the altar of the great, the stars, the rich that it idolizes. Secondarily, these characteristics of people in need that Jesus talks about, hungry and thirsty, strangers, desperate need of clothing, sick and in prison, these characteristics are not only people in physical need, but they are in spiritual need. The least of these might be those who are spiritually or physically hungry and thirsty. They might be strangers who are not accepted or welcome in physical or spiritual places. Those who are physically or spiritually naked. Those who are in need of healing physically or spiritually or both. The least of these that Jesus talks about in Matthew 25 might be those who are in need of rescue from a place physically or spiritually of bondage and oppression. And the third point I want to make out as we begin to conclude, this list that Jesus considers to be the least of these, as he calls them, his brothers and sisters, is not an exhaustive or complete list of all those whom he regards as the least of these. Let me stop and let's personalize this a little bit more for you and me as we consider, again, those that Jesus would consider overlooked, dismissed, and marginalized by our culture and our world. Without presuming to dogmatically speak for Jesus, I think we would be on safe ground if we assumed that he might say to us today, I was your aged parent or loved one or friend, but you didn't ignore me. You visited me. You cared for me, and you let me know of your love. You served me in the most mundane and menial ways, helping me with my most elementary, basic human needs. Thank you for being Jesus to me. Not long ago, I called a dear loved one to congratulate her on her 90th birthday. She was so thankful that someone would take the time to talk to her, and we spent some time talking about her dear departed husband, and she told me she'd never had a son, but she would have been proud to call me her son. And then she said with a tone of sadness, not critically or in a nasty way, but just sadness, I have two daughters. They don't live that far away. I just can't get them to come and visit me. I can barely get them to call me on the phone. When I finished talking to her I and hung up on the phone, I was so thankful to God for the life of Jesus who lives within me and prompted me to call her and spend a little time with her. I don't get the credit for that phone call. It wasn't me who gets the credit. It's Jesus. Without presuming to speak dogmatically for Jesus, I think we'd be on safe ground if we we assume that he might say, I was a rebellious, self-willed teenager who was really hard to get along with, but you, as a parent, hung in there, and you loved me anyway. Thank you for being Jesus to me. Again, not speaking dogmatically for Jesus, not presuming he would say this, but I think we're on safe ground if he would say something like, I was your next door neighbor. I wasn't really very nice to you. In fact, I was nasty. Sometimes I would let my dog bark too much. Sometimes I wouldn't take care of my house or yard. And sometimes I'd have loud parties, but you returned good for evil. You returned smiles for my scowls. Thank you for being Jesus to me. Maybe Jesus might say, I was your spouse. I was selfish. I drank too much. And there were times in our marriage when I paid too much attention to others rather than you. Sometimes I said some really rude things to you. I hurt you and I made you cry, but your love didn't stop. You stayed with me. You were patient. You forgave me. Thank you for being Jesus to me. Take some time to pray about the little ones in your life. Ask your heavenly father to reach out to them. In the name of Jesus, let's pray. Father, thank you for little ones. Thank you for your love for them. Thank you for loving us. We're all little ones. And thank you for enabling, inspiring us to love them as well. In your name. And we pray in that name. Amen. Once again, what a joy and privilege it is to minister to all of you and in a variety of ways. You're listening on the radio, on the internet, on CDs, in a variety of ways. Thank you. And let us just tell you as we conclude, give you a little teaser about our message next week from Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 15. If you want to study the passage ahead of time, 
Luke 16, 1 through 15, embezzling, insider trading, and grace. May God be with you and bless you. Please join us on our website, www.ptm.org, for more spiritual nourishment that we provide through the many ministries and resources here at Plain Truth Ministries.